Welcome to a documentary first, an inside look at a first time filmmaker's journey. I am your host, Josh Lindsay from the Movie Proposal Podcast. And with us is our first time filmmaker, Christian Taylor. Hello, Josh, but I am not really with you. My mind is in all of the previous <laughs> technical difficulties that we've just survived. I'm trying yeah. to shake that off, but I am here bodily. So, hi. We're, we're, we're 20 <laughs> minutes in and we're just getting started. That's just sometimes <laughs> how it goes. So, uh, but uh, with us as always, and especially grateful for him today, is our button pushing guy, Jason Rugg. Hey there. Seriously, uh, we would not be recording without Jason. Right now. <laughs> we would literally not be recording. <laughs> yes, everybody needs to send him a uh, send him a donation. <laughs> Keep him on the show. And today we have a very special guest, a not so first time filmmaker, Chris White. Chris, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, this is this is great. I'm a big fan of this podcast, Christian. I love the idea of a podcast that's dedicated to your journey with the film that any of us who've made a film, whether your first film or your hundredth film can relate to and empathize with. And that's, that to me is why every, every episode of the, of the podcast is worth listening to worth experiencing. And I've, I've enjoyed all the ones that I've, I've connected with. Um, well, I really appreciate that. It means a lot to me that you say that. But, you know, as I think about what you're saying, the film industry changes so rapidly, like mm -hmm. everything is changing, especially now we're in the Wild West. And so I am kind of going through this and looking at all these changes and hopefully it'll be useful to somebody somewhere. Yeah, I, I have a, a quick story I want to share uh, based on Chris's comments. I was in film school for one year and our my big project was a documentary. I drove three hours to another town to film it on, you know, 16 millimeter film. I made sure I, I, I was ahead of the game. I, I, I shot it early. Turns out the, the shutter wasn't working. So I, I paid to have all this film developed and it was black. Oh, oh. The, in class, the professor announces to everyone, hey, Lindsay shot his entire film, but forgot to check the shutter and developed a bunch of film. And developing a film is not, cheap and so <laughs> i spent all this money on nothing at the end of class i was surrounded by all the other students josh what did you do tell me so i don't do this i was very popular for a day so people could learn <laughs> how not to do what i did so i think that's a good analogy for your, your film christian I can't believe we're two years in. In fact, we are celebrating our two-year anniversary. Woohoo! We are two years in, Josh Lindsay, and I have never heard that story. That is, <laughs> that's crazy. That's pretty awesome. Well, I, I know something Chris said triggered that memory. I think I kept it way deep down. It was a traumatic experience for me. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Well, I'm so glad we're having Chris here. Why don't you give his little introduction and let's get going. Oh, wait a second. Wait I a did, second. I know. I did that in the podcast we didn't record. We need an update on yeah. Christian's film. <laughs> I think you're in a film festival or two, something like yeah, that. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get through this really fast because I've already done it once. So uh, I'm excited to announce we are in the GI Film Festival. It's our first veteran film festival. It takes place mid-May in San Diego, but really virtually. So anywhere you are, you can watch us at the GI Film Festival mid-May. But even before that, next week, we're going to be at the Thin Line Documentary Film Festival, which is in Denton, Texas, but also virtual. And so coming right to your living room. And this one is so exciting because it's free. It's free. All you have to do is register at the Thin Line Film Festival website and you can have access. There are two specific screening days that you can watch the film live. And afterwards, uh, there will be a live Q&A with me, yours truly. So uh, that's exciting. And then we've got an in-person one in Dubuque, Iowa, the middle of April. And I really, really recommend getting to Iowa to see us. And uh, we've got a World War II reenactment camp that we're setting up and some World War II veterans and friends people so it's going to be a, a wonderful time so that's what's happening in that world we're still fulfilling our distribution deliverables we still are aiming to release around memorial day weekend and um, so that's the update from from where i sit with the film awesome well i i know a lot of people have, have said to me that they they want to see the film and i think especially it being free would be a uh, yeah a great opportunity to check it out so um, all right, well, let's uh, let's jump into our interview with Chris. Uh, I'm going to read 
Chris's bio here. Uh, Chris is an award-winning filmmaker who spent over a decade writing, directing, and producing a variety of feature length and short films. His most recent, recent project is movie-centric coming-of-age comedy, Electric Jesus, which explores a world of fictional 80s Christian hair metal band called 316. The film stars Brian Baumgartner, which you may know as Kevin from The Office, Jed Nelson, who stars in The Breakfast Club and St. Elmo's Fire, and newcomers Shannon Hutchinson and Andrew, I believe it's Eagle, who were both great in the film, which by the way, they, they were probably my favorite part of the film, so great casting there. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Chris is co-writer for the songs in the film. So, and you're in film, you won Best Director at the Orlando Film Festival. And the Buford one. And the Buford one. So it, the, the film is pretty darn, darn cool. And we'd love to talk about your experience. So again, welcome, Chris. Um, now, you've only been making films for 10 years. Well, you know, uh, I, I guess... 10 years ago is when I quit my day job to do this. And let me, Which was? Um, well, at the time I was, I was a high school drama teacher, but I had worked in advertising and marketing and uh, I directed TV commercials and stuff. And so, you know, I always, always think of it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 50 years old. Okay. So it's, it's like, I'm, I feel old in this, you know, you go to festivals, especially you hang out with a bunch of 20 somethings, you know, and um, but I kind of hit, I kind of came into filmmaking, was able to pursue it like I did because I, I came in at the right moment. I came at the moment when DSLR cameras became pretty uh, mainstream. And so, and, and the deal with a DSLR is just that you could actually shoot video that looked like a movie, you know, HD video with, you could change the lenses out and look like a movie. And um and, and to me, that was a game changer. That was, that was some, and also at the moment when crowdfunding, you know, my first few projects were totally crowdfunded. So there was a way to um, create an audience before you'd made the movie and even get some cash in to help pay for it. So, so that was good. But I did come into filmmaking 10 years ago with many years of experience and training as, you know, as an actor uh, in directing, screenwriting, um, business, marketing and PR, um, directing. I directed a short film in the 90s and then I did a lot of commercials and advertising kind of stuff. I, even theater, like I was, I spent four years as a theater teacher in a high school and a film film criticism teaching, teacher. So I was, I was well prepared for my moment. And I should say my wife was also ready for the moment as well. And, and um, you know, so many of us know that if, if your spouse, if your partner is not on board with your crazy dream, it can be very difficult to pursue it. Um, but she was ready to take a big swing and take a, take a risk and, and live with the risk. And, that, and she has very complementary skills to mine. So most people, even if you started out 10 years ago, I mean, I, I consider myself very privileged and fortunate to have those things that came together for me. Um, so... Um, even talking about like giving advice to people or saying, you know, just commenting on what other people do, I find very difficult because it's like, well, I had a really good launching point, you know, you know, compared to many people. And um, so it's, it's hard to be prescriptive about things sometimes, but, um, but I, I, I would say, yeah, yeah. 10 years of uh, quitting your day job doesn't mean you don't hustle up gigs. You know, I still hu hustle up gigs, you know, writing gigs or, um, most of them are film and producing related now. Um, but you know, you, you, you still have to, you still have to make money. And, and so, um, a lot of it is, um, uh, is gig, gig work, creative entrepreneurship, that sort of thing. So this is a first time filmmakers podcast. So go back 10 years or so ago and think you as a first time filmmaker, what, what were the you know, things maybe, even though you had some experience, what were some things you learned or challenges you faced? Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, kind of to your point with the, the story of the 16 millimeter uh, film exposed with, with nothing to show for it. Good story, um, huh? <laughs> it, I mean, don't we, I mean, hopefully we learn from mistakes. Um, and I certainly have made a lot of mistakes. I was, um, 
you know, I think one mistake I've made and learned from <laughs> that that is easy is often a common mistake that I think first time filmmakers make is um, I think I believed way too much in my own personal charisma and charm, like my wits to win the day. Um, I don't think I'm as witty or persuasive as I like to think I am. <laughs> so starting out, you know, even having a great idea for a movie or maybe you're talking to an actor about acting in a movie, you know, I just kind of thought, well, I'm doing this cool thing and I'm a cool, fun guy. I'm fun to talk to. Uh, they'll go along with it. And, and certainly to some degree, I think that helps, but then in the, the rigors of filmmaking, everything from, you know, the rigors of production to, to uh, fundraising uh, development. And then even as you get into the final stages, delivering the movie and everything, you'll find out pretty quickly that all your charm and all your, uh, you know, your personal charisma uh, will run out uh, or just won't work with some people. So you actually have to know some stuff and have uh, a smart plan behind you. So, I, I mean, that's, I don't know if anybody can relate to that, but that's, that's definitely a, a, a mistake uh, that I made. And I think I've, I'm pulling, I'm understanding that now as I go, as I continue into new things. Well, so all have, in, oh, I'm sorry, ahead. Josh. No, I was going to say, in all fairness to you, Chris, um, I have only met you now for, and only known you for about four to six weeks. I met you at the Beaufort Film Festival. It was a wonderful experience. I can't wait to get back. Uh, we had a lovely time. Um, and I found you to be those things, charming and fun and insightful. And um, you are you know, wonderfully winning to be around. And that does go a long way, I think, in the beginning to kind of hook people with your vision. And if you yeah. can paint a vision and you can inspire people, which I feel like you can, um, then people, that's that's a huge catalyst for getting a lot of people involved. But you're right. If you don't have what it takes to see things through, and if you don't know what you're talking about, that goodwill that you garner from the beginning is burned up. I, I used to say when I was a school teacher, I would say my my personal charisma lasts eight months. So the good news is, Christian, I, I've not I've not run out of personal charisma with you because we just met. But, <laughs> but the last month of school, you know, I was like treading water with most of my students. <laughs> no, but I think some of it, you know, we all encounter people maybe that we don't click with or we just flat out don't like or they rub us the wrong way or what, however you put it. And, you know, every all of us are going to meet people like that. And in this, in the pursuit that we're all pursuing here, like you still have to break through and work and win. Even when you're standing across from somebody who doesn't care much for you or you don't care much for them, we still have to figure out how to get along and, and make good stuff happen. And uh, I didn't, I just didn't think about that that much when I was starting. I just thought um, my overwhelming tidal wave of optimism would win the day. And um, sometimes it did, um, but not all the time. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah. So we have, you know, first time filmmakers listening to this podcast. Now that you've got, you know, obviously a decade of experience and, and more under your belt. And, and things obviously have changed even more in the film industry since you've got started. What, what advice do you give now to filmmakers who are just getting started at this point? I just don't. I don't. <laughs> I don't tell them anything um, because. I don't know. I don't know what's going to work for you. I, I, you know, I. Okay. All right. I'm going to stop you right there. I'm going to rescue you. Here's how I'm going to rescue you. Okay. Because I, I want you to tell me about this incredible film that you have coming out. Now, before you begin, I would like Jason and Josh just to say a few words because they watched it and I really want to hear what they, they say. Uh, Jason sent me a message last night saying, wow, I did not expect that. So Jason, tell me a little bit about, you know, your experience watching Electric Jesus. Yeah, so Electric Jesus uh, really clicked for me, particularly because like, it, you know, I, I grew up a little bit later, you know, I was born in 95. So it's not like I grew up in in this scene, but right. I I definitely clicked with like the Christian music scene, like not much had changed in, in yeah. like the, the early to mid two thousands. 
Um, so it was really fascinating to just the the phrases that you would hear. <laughs> it's just like, oh, I forgot that was something they used to say yeah. at youth group. Like it's just it, it really clicked with me. And particularly the ending just punched me right in the heart because like yeah. About no a month. Spoilers, no spoilers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's true. That's true. Yeah, I can't. I can't really talk too much about it. But it, a similar event happened to me towards oh, the really? end. Wow. Ending, with one of my friends. Um, and so it was just kind of this shock. You murdered one of your friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, uh, and oh, yeah. <laughs> it it just it really hit me because one of the things that I connected with that person about was music too. Mm -hmm. So this whole film just felt like it was tailor-made for me and, you know, growing up in that sort of scene. So yeah, I, I absolutely. Uh, I, I love hearing that. Thank you for saying that. And that that's makes me so happy. Um, I'm, you know, when you, when you go down into the, you know, this cave of creativity and you're, you're trying to make something, it's, you, you, you have to, you know, you try to block out, I try to block out what is everybody going to think or how is everybody going to react. I'm, I'm trying to tell the story as I see it and present the story as I think it best to do. And so the fun part of the being on the other side of it now is conversations like this where you can say, oh yeah, I really, man, was tracking with that, which is, um, you know, now I get to enjoy that. Yeah. <laughs> but, but if I was in the cave making the, making the movie and I was thinking, you know, what is Jason Rugg going to think of my movie? You know, <laughs> this or that, it, it wouldn't be that right. good, you know, or, yeah. or it wouldn't work that much for you. Yeah. Um, so you had, you had to make what was true yeah. to you for it to be true to me. Yeah. 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 Right. So, Chris, uh, before Jason gives his review, uh, and and he actually is pretty good at that because I don't know if you've listened, but he does the movie proposal yes. proposal podcast. So, uh, so anyway, before he weighs in, why don't you give us the logline of your film, and just you know tell us a little bit about that, and then we'll see what Jason thinks or Josh thinks. It's been so long since I wrote the logline, but I think what the logline is, or what my you're my supposed to have is. that right here. I wrote it a long time ago. He's already made it. He doesn't need uh, it anymore. Uh, <laughs> uh, Alabama preacher's daughter runs away with a Christian rock band during the summer of 1986. That's what happened. Ta -da. Ta -da. <laughs> yeah. And it's a coming of age film, a la yes. you know that thing you do, uh, and it does look at the. Cr I mean, I'm sorry. I'm just gonna tell you what i saw okay, yes. uh, if, it, uh, if it comes down to what does the movie mean i usually ask a grad student I don't know what <laughs> but for plotting and what it is i very much defer to you yeah so uh i it is a coming of age film that looks at the christian uh the born again christian subculture uh in the 80s where uh christian music was just coming to life and there were a lot of interesting things happening there mostly uh bands that wanted to sound like other bands yeah. uh and they were uh, you know sort of pattering themselves after that and chris and i actually grew up in that same time in this 80s christian culture uh so when i saw this film what i said to him is oh my gosh you know this is absolutely my reality and i recognize that world completely and what i loved about the film was that you poked fun at your own tribe but not in a demeaning way that uh, really kind of tore things apart, but caused you to be thoughtful as you considered that whole world and what was good about it and what probably needed to, you know, fall away about it. So I, I think there's an important distinction when you're making, especially something that purports to be a comedy that, you know, I, I didn't want to make fun of Christians in the movie, but I did want to have fun with Christians and, and all the Christians I've been friends with my whole life. We've always had fun together, <laughs> you know, like, um, so, and, and I just hadn't seen that uh, again, going to what Jason was saying, like they, the, um, the voice, the way they talked, like I never, I could hear it clearly in my head from youth group days and even, you know, church days as an adult, uh, a lot of, but I just never seen it in a movie. And I also didn't want to, uh, punch down or, or make fun of it. I just wanted it to be what it is, you know, and, and then let you draw your conclusions from it. You know, there's, there's some people, you know, there are two, some of the most passionate fans of the film, at least on the um, festival circuit have been ex evangelicals or agnostic atheists, like people who have left the church and would not call themselves 
uh, Christians in any way who just, I, I, a guy saw it the other day when I was in Atlanta and, and he just said, oh, I'm not a Christian, but I mean, he was just struck. He was like, that was, that was my life. Like that was, you know, and I could tell he was just touched and pulled by some of the nostalgia for it, but it was, it was even more, I, there was like a sweetness that he was remembering and he, he wasn't, I don't know. It was a really touching thing. And, and, and he started rattling off all, you know, there's a scene where the main character, they say, what do you like to listen to? And he names 66 uh, Christian bands. Just I bands. love that scene so <laughs> much. So <laughs> and this guy was like, every one of those bands I knew. And he's <laughs> driving home asking Spotify to play, you know, you know, you know, pull the 77s. I haven't heard them in forever, you know? So um, again, yeah, they're, I'm I'm, in, I'm excited that people who would not call themselves Christians are really drawn to it and seem to relate to it. Um, and I think maybe that's only possible if we just if we just are able to um, not judge it in any way, if that makes any sense, not judge the audience, not judge the characters, just let the story unfold. Yeah. So, and, jo uh, Josh, what do you think? Oh, yeah, sorry, one, Jason. One quick thing. Just I want to say. It is maybe the most accurate depiction of youth group culture I've ever seen. That yeah. like everything else is just, you know, it's a it's a parody of itself almost. This was so freaking accurate <laughs> as to what youth group and lock-ins and all that is like. It was just spot on. <laughs> I uh the first meeting I had with Judd Nelson, who plays the pastor in the movie, he had come in to uh where we were filming and it's my character meeting with him. And we're sitting in the office and we all we did was talk about the Bible the whole time. He he didn't even want to talk about the character. He was just, like, <laughs> talking about Old Testament, New Testament and um was he was a Christian? Just, he grew up in a Christian subculture or was he trying to figure it out? Jewish. I think he's Jewish. Oh um, yeah. But he, uh, he, well, he, he, um, one thing that was really cool about it was I was like, yeah, in my youth group, he's trying to understand the world I grew up in. And I said, in my world, we saw your movies. We loved your movies. We were allowed to see them. We just weren't allowed to do anything you guys did. <laughs> 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 But, but the other thing is, you know, I was thinking back to being my youth group and, you know, Judd Nelson was a huge movie star at the time. And, you know, it's just like, um, I was just thinking, man, that would be so cool if my youth group knew that I just spent two hours talking to Judd Nelson about the Bible. I think that's what <laughs> all we're kind of praying would happen, right? <laughs> um, so, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. awesome. Okay, sorry. I didn't mean to cut off Josh. No, no, that's fine. Uh, well, I, I watched it with my 14 year old son and I, I will tell you is if he doesn't like a movie, he will let you know. In mm -hmm. fact, just stop watching it. He watched it all the way through with me. Uh, we laughed out loud, which is a great sign, uh, yeah. because, especially for a comedy. Right. I, I can't. Mm -hmm. Yes. We, we just had fun watching it. I, I what surprised me because I, I didn't grow up in that subculture. I it was yeah. until college that I started like it was almost like history lessons for me as I met friends who were Christians who grew up in those subcultures. So um, it definitely spoke true to me. I just didn't live in that subculture. Um, but what's, what surprised me about the film, because I was trying to guess, is this a Christian film? That's kind of a stereotypical one. Is this going to make fun of Christians? And somehow it landed in the middle. Um, and I agree with everything that Jason said, but I thought going into it that, the actors, you know, Brian Baumgartner, Judd Nelson, I thought they were going to carry the film because, you know, like, hey, this is kind of an indie film. These guys are going to you know, propel it forward. To be honest with you, they were fine. But I was more interested in Eric's character. Like he he was phenomenal. Yeah, I, I think the casting was, you know, besides all the other things that went into it, this, you know, the directing and the writing is like, wow, you I think you hit a home run with the casting especially with uh, the girl, Shannon Hutchinson, who played Sarah, and then Andrew, who played Eric, because I enjoyed watching them so much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so I, 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 was, I, I think at the end, I, I liked it, but I was scratching my head. Like, well, I had two questions. Like, why did I like it? And what was this? Because it wasn't a, like I said, stereotypical Christian film, and it wasn't uh, making fun in a mean way. It was like, wh why do I not see more stuff like this? <laughs> I guess is maybe uh, my question. That's another podcast, but I'd love to 
we should explore that. I would love to have that conversation conversation with you. Even that sounds like a great dinner conversation as well. Um, um, I will say this. Um, so the faith, the movie isn't a faith based movie, and and I'm not slamming faith based movies. I'm just saying there's a there's a genre called faith based movie, and it has boxes to check that make it a faith based movie, right? The movie is faith laced maybe you know there's christianity and religion in the movie there are religious there are non-ironic non-ironically religious people uh practicing their faith uh as they would practice it um but you know i mean well i'll say this um I, i'll get at this josh um i i was I, I, it wasn't so much I was resisting it being a Christian movie or a faith-based movie as much as I was insisting it be a coming-of-age movie where the teenagers didn't talk like 40-year-olds, because that is part of that genre, is a lot of us go to see teenagers in a movie because they're written by 40 and 50-year-olds who are trying to <laughs> fix, the, fix their lives, right? So I'm trying to stay out of the way and let them do it, but I was... and and. I don't know that this is entirely successful with the movie, um, but it's definitely the aim of the movie. I was, I was trying, I was going on this journey with Eric, who you mentioned, Andrew um, Eckel, um, who's telling us a story that he's told many to hundreds of times over the years for decades. And this time when he's telling the story, he realizes that he's been telling it wrong. So we are in real time hearing the story as told in a memory and then having the epiphany he has at the same moment. And it takes mm -hmm. an event at the end. We don't want to talk about uh, the, the spoiler alert thing at the end, but it takes that for him to go, you know, oh man, that was never my story. You know, it was somebody else's. And I think that is kind of a... To me, that's how we redeem nostalgia. I don't think nostalgia for its own sake, sake it's just, it's, nostalgia is just sentimental, right? And that's fine. It's sentimentality, which I would define as unearned emotion, maybe. I think there's stronger emotions and there's stronger things that come up and even resonate with you, as you say, like, I, I don't know why this is, what this is doing to me, be, because I think the film fights hard to be that, be what it is at the end. And what it is at the end is, movie has stopped he realized what the story was goodbye credits roll and we do the funny you know outtakes in the end and play fun music you know <laughs> but but that's the trick of the movie is and and that was even bringing it in in the edit finishing the film is recognizing or, or, or crafting how that would work and again i i'm not claiming it's it's brilliant or perfect or, or man, I really knocked it out of the park on that. I mean, there's several things that I, you know, I want back and I, w I would probably do differently, but that's why, you know, and what helps it is, is an actor like Andrew Eckel, um, who's going on that journey. And that, that kid's going to be a movie star. He's amazing. Oh, yeah. He's a looking kid. He's so good. He stays right in the pocket. It's hard to play the lead and carry a movie. And he really does um in in an exceptional way that scene where he gets up in the hotel room and tells the band we're gonna go play this this you know this real rock and roll we're gonna go to purgatorio we're gonna play this show i get chills every time because his his delivery of the monologue is so good and so sincere and you know so um and but but his character is full of flaws i mean his character is very self-righteous his his character is in love with a girl and never tells her <laughs> and then gets mad at her when it turns out she wasn't dating him, you know, like, um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I really appreciate your comments. I'm, I'm very excited to know that your uh, teenager, uh, like the movie, my son who's 22 is, is similar. He will tell you immediately if he likes uh, a movie or not. And he told me, he's like, dad, this is, this is actually really good. Like people are going to quote stuff from this. I was like, good. <laughs> well, I think that's and, true. 
I'm going to uh, just, we don't have a ton of time and there's so much I want to cover here. Um, yeah. there, there are two things. One, I really would like for you to talk about casting because this is a documentary podcast. I did not uh, have any casting in my film, but there are a lot of filmmakers listening and there's more than first time people listening to this. Um, so I've never dealt with major casting like that, but this was such an interestingly casted film because you did have these, you know, new people like Sarah, who the one who played Sarah um, was phenomenal. I mean, she was just phenomenal. She's not even 21 yet. She couldn't drink when we went out, uh, but she could <laughs> sing her little heart out and she was so talented. And of course there's Andrew and then you have these older performers and there, this was a union. Uh, this was a union film. So talk a little bit about working with the film and casting union actors, especially the, the ones with, you know, that are more famous. Talk about that experience. Well, this was a very special case for this movie. Um, I had always heard stories about the movie Dead Poet Society, which I loved growing up. And Me about too. how they cast these young actors and then they brought in Robin Williams and they just, he was like a mentor and friend and everybody lived together and there was just a, an excitement and just the relationships were built. And this comes through in the movie. So that's what happened here. I did not want... Uh, you know, Disney show kids or the kid with the biggest uh, Instagram account or the prettiest kid or the kids that's just about to make it in LA. Uh, we shopped for these kids <laughs> everywhere. Um, we wanted kids almost like Super 8, you know, how in Super 8, with the exception of Elle Fanning, everybody looks like a real person, you know, and they look up people you grew up with. And that's what we were looking for. We were looking for normal, well, uh, Stranger Things maybe does that. And so that took a second to find those people. And then also they had to be really good actors, but then we had to throw them in a house together and they lived together and made food together and went back and forth to the set uh, together. I, I think of that, those six, um, I think half of them were in the union, were already SAG members or at least SAG eligible. And the others of course became union actors through our movie. Um, SAG, uh, Screen Actors Guild, is uh, just from a producer's standpoint, to me, that they're, they're the best union in the business to work with. Um, there are complicating factors with other unions in, in uh, Hollywood, but that's a really good one. And, you know, even Brian Baumgartner, you know, he knew, you know, he's number one on the call sheet, as they say, you know, he's he's the top dog in the movie because of his stature and fame and experience and all that. And, and even he was great. Um, I mean, that all happened. Like he did the Robin Williams thing. He went in and became friends with them and mentored them and told them about the Screen Actors Guild and told them about when you move to LA, this, this, and this. And so um, it was just, I mean, it sounds very charming and sweet because it was, it was the, the, I mean, I still think of all those kids as like my nephews and niece, uh, Shannon. Uh, I, I just uh, directed a short with Shannon um, this past summer, you know? Um, so, uh, and I'm in touch with them all the time. I talk to them all the time. Um, we're, we're about to announce our release date for the film. This will be information that's coming out very soon. And, you know, they'll text me almost weekly. Is it, is it tomorrow? Are you, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are we there yet? <laughs> uh, but, and it's always like, you'll be the first to know. You'll be the first to know um, as soon as I know the date and can tell you. But, um, I, you know, I, I don't, I wouldn't get hung up as a producer on getting famous people. I mean, you just have to have the money to pay them and a casting director. And that's, that's not difficult it's not difficult to put your film, to put your script in front of anybody famous that you'd be interested in. I, I was interested, uh, this is, I don't know if I've told people this, I was interested in Jim Gaffigan as that part. Early. I love him. And I uh, had a mutual friend, I've met him before, and I was, I went to Sundance um, in 2019 and saw that he was talking or he's going to be somewhere. And I, I purposed to meet him you know, to walk up and say, Jim, I'm Chris White, I'm friends with whoever, and I've got this movie called Electric Jesus. And he's like, oh man, is it good? Is it good? I'm like, yeah, it's good. And the script's really good. <laughs> and, and he's like, okay, okay. He's like, writes down his email, send me the script. But, and he couldn't do it because they were touring. Uh, he was touring that summer in uh, the UK. But, but so much of that is timing. It's, it's not even... 
money. I mean, you'll find the budget you have for your film. And yes, Brian Baumgartner would tell you that he liked the script because it gave him an opportunity to do all this stuff he's never done. You know, he used to be a stage actor. You know, he was a theater guy and had so, has so much range in his, in his acting, you know, ability. And so, yeah, he was, he was like, loved the script and loved the idea of playing that part. Um, but, you know, we still had to pay him, you know, um, and we, we paid him more than scale. We paid him like you'd pay the star of a movie at that budget range. And um, so, I mean, you know, timing is so much. I mean, if the timing had been different, maybe Jim Gaffigan would have been in that role. You know, so it's just, and I can't even imagine it with Gaffigan now. Um, yeah. I actually think Brian's a better actor than Jim Gaffigan. Um, but well, and for that role, he was, he was absolutely perfect. I mean, it was just, he was perfect. Yeah. Um, lovable. So, loser. Lovable. Yeah. Loser. Yeah. Well, and there was a lot of heart there. I mean, I think that's one thing that people miss about Brian. What I loved about his role in that film is there was a lot of what you typically see from him, but there was also a lot of heart and real acting that, um, you know, carried the film as well. So I thought he did a great job. So funny. So, you know, just just little throwaway lines and stuff. We would just amuse each other, you know, as we we're talking, I was like, no, 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 wait, wait, do it again and say, uh, let's say this, you know, like he brought a little bit of that vibe from the set of the office because I, I said, bring that all in. I don't, I don't know what that's, it seems like the best place in the world to work. Tell me more. What, how do we do that? You know? And he was, he was very generous with how he shared his time and his expertise and his, his knowledge. Um, so that's awesome. Can we talk a little bit about the music? So the music was phenomenal. It was uh, memorable. It was hilarious. And you had a large part in writing those things. So talk and we have exciting news to announce about what happened with the music in the film. So why don't you talk a little bit about that? Um, so, you know, I'm writing the screenplay, um, you know, in a screenplay format, uh, a page of screenplay tends to equal a minute of screen time. So it's important that your pages match uh, what the film is. So when I would get to songs, I would want to put lyrics in, you know, for the different songs. So they're the band in the film 316, they have some original songs. So I wrote um, three songs to start us. I think I wrote lyrics to three different songs, a power ballad, uh, the big arena rocker commando, and then the, um, uh, the heavy one, Barabbas. And um, so, I did write those, but I found this incredible collaborator. His name is Daniel Smith. He's kind of an indie rock god. He, he is from a band called Danielson. Uh, he's out of uh, Southern New Jersey. He, most people probably know him because he uh, produced the first Sufjan Stevens album. And um, uh, he's in a band with a Christian artist named Steve Taylor uh, right now. So, um, but Daniel grew up in Christian culture. Uh, Daniel's father is a, a musician and a composer. And so he and I met and really hit it off. And I said, what were you doing in 1986? And he was like listening to Def Leppard and was like, okay, let's do this. You know? So, <laughs> so yeah. And the deal with the song was the songs, the songs should be good. They should be good songs. The lyrics could be silly or the lyrics could be the character's voice. You know, I'm writing lyrics that are a 15 year old sincere, you know, religious rock songs, I guess. But Daniel had the task of actually making the music good because who wants to sit there for a two hour movie and listen to a bunch of terrible songs? I mean, that that joke would run thin. Um, so he created this idea that the whole movie's a memory. And a lot of bands, a lot of music we like when we were younger sound better in our memory than it does in, in actual practice. So what you're hearing is what Eric remembers the band to sound like. <laughs> but the cool thing is, you know, there's a record out now. Um, actually, the, the vinyl is shipping uh, in a couple months. But right now you can go on Spotify, Amazon Music, all the streamers, and you can look up Electric Jesus. Um, music from and inspired by the movie and not only does it have those 316 songs and and every song from the movie uh, but it also has some of the 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 score music where daniel daniel took like a song like commando for christ and he took the melody in it and made it part of the the score for the movie um and uh girl i love jesus too the power ballad becomes <laughs> our love theme and it, and it comes up again. So I love the record. Even some of the evil bands uh, that play at the club at the end 
uh, all three of those bands get a song on the record so you can hear what soul exhumation sounds like or <laughs> <laughs> clutch you can listen to them and then also there's a a disgraced christian super group called joy explosion they're riding around in joy explosions rv the whole movie and there's a joy explosion song on the record and um so just just lots of cool fun stuff on the record and the record uh, obviously we dropped the record before the movie to bring attention to the movie and attention to the music that's awesome. I want to ask you one last question. Um, I don't know. It may be the last. It may not. But I want you to talk a little bit about um, the film festival experience, because what I learned when I was at Buford with you is that is like your hometown. Like you started with a script there, I think. And then yeah. I don't know if you did a short and then you did the feature a bit. I mean, you had a long relationship with this festival. And I think for filmmakers, that's a very interesting thing to uh, to hear. So tell us about your your journey with the Beaufort Film Festival? Well, um, I'll speak in general and then I'll talk specifically about them. In general, uh, when nobody knows who you are and nobody's paying attention to your movies, be they short or feature length or your series or whatever, if even your writing, if nobody knows you, nobody's paying attention to you, um, it can be useful to pursue exposure at film festivals. Um, this has been a tough year for them because so many have gone online and what I mean by tough, that's not tough that you can still see movies and get exposure. The tough thing is what for us, I live in South Carolina. It's been beneficial, not just at the Beaufort Film Festival, but at others to go and meet other filmmakers just like yourself. You know, we, yeah. I'm here because we met at that festival and that lack of, you know, especially in a year when I had a really good movie, you know, like Electric Jesus, this should be at a lot of festivals. It was like most festivals weren't taking as many movies and weren't even happening physically. So, you know, and I got into some really good festivals with this movie, um, but they didn't even, you know, it was kind of like, uh, they didn't quite happen. You know, Virginia Film Festival, SCAD, uh, Nashville, you know, some really good festivals. And, but here's, here's what I'd say to filmmakers, um, just like with different levels of filmmaking, beginner, intermediate, you know, advanced, whatever, then there's different kinds of film festivals. And, just because you submit to the Toronto International Film Festival, which is one of the biggest film festivals in the world, bar none, and your short doesn't get in, that doesn't necessarily mean that your short, your film isn't any good or uh, you're never going to make it or what. I mean, that's why there are other tiers of film festivals and there's probably festivals uh, nearer to you. Um, and, and also, you know, you got to know what your film is and what it isn't and look around at festivals and say, well, that one kind of takes movies like mine. And I think they might consider mine. Um, so you, um, but they can be very useful, very beneficial. They're certainly a good way to celebrate and uh, it's to celebrate the people who helped you make your movie. Um, because, you know, when they physically happen, that that can be a party for everybody to get together and see each other and uh, reconnect. Um, but yeah, I, I live in South Carolina, the, the festival in our state that seems to be the most successful. It's been around, you know, over a decade is the one in Beaufort down on the coast. And, um, yeah, I've had, uh, mm, I, I've had, um, a feature that I made called cinema purgatorio there. Um, I don't think get better. Our other feature was there, but we did have a couple shorts that we did with friends that have been there. So I just like, it's a beautiful place and I like going down and I get to meet people like you um, that I otherwise wouldn't have any way to know or connect with except for this, this social event uh, around movies. Yeah, I loved it for that exact same reason. I thought, but I I want you to speak specifically about you put your you put this particular script in the script competition, right? That is that how it started? Um, that wasn't the first time I've been in that festival. And no, 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 with Electric Jesus, like the birth of Electric Jesus. Yeah, um, we were in the process of of soliciting investors, and we thought let's put the screenplay in a competition and then let's bring the cast down and do a table read and let's just generate some, some social media interests so that when we're meeting with some, you know, so-and-so over here, we can say, oh yeah, by the way, we're at this film festival. Oh, here's a, here's a video of uh, Shannon Hutchinson. She's our star here. She is busking on the street uh, in Beaufort, South Carolina with Wyatt Linhart, who's also in the movie. And, 
you know, so we we used that. We, it wasn't like we were trying to win the award for the best screenplay or anything like that. We were using it as an event to draw attention to, hey, these people are making this movie and it's going to be really good. And it was hugely successful in that way because it provided, you know, one, it got me to sit around a table with my cast and experience the movie. Um, but also it was able, we were able to generate some media assets that we used that helped us raise money. That's awesome. That's exactly what I was looking for in asking you that question, because I think that was sort of out of the box thinking. And I think I would love to, you know, people to think about other ways to, uh, you know, to approach a film festival, approach a script, approach marketing and fundraising. So that was awesome. Yeah. Well, I want to give Jason and Josh some time. Uh, you guys got any follow up questions for Chris? I have a very important question I have to ask. I was reading an article about you, Chris, and it said something to the effect that you're best friends with Ryan Johnson. Is that right? Uh, I, that is not the quote. If that came out of my mouth, I apologize to Ryan Johnson. <laughs> um, when I was a high school teacher, I uh, high school drama teacher, I thought it, I had just seen the film Brick and I thought it would make a great stage play. And this is like 2009, I think. And uh, so I sent a message into the internet and said, dear Ryan Johnson, can I make Brick into a play? And lo and behold, <laughs> he responded and said, yes, you may. I think that's the coolest thing I've ever heard. Yes, you can make Brick into a play. And we did. And he came wow. to Greenville, South Carolina and saw, and saw, I mean, talk about terrifying. Can you imagine like <laughs> Ryan Johnson watching Brick the play? And uh, he loved it. He's the best guy ever. And, um, he, um, in fact, I, I had a, he and I were spending some time together in Los Angeles soon after that. And I told him about electric Jesus and he was like, so into it. Um, so, um, so yeah, I had an encounter where I, I met him and, you know, made this play based on his first film. And, uh, the play has been done in a lot of places been done in Chicago and Australia. I got to go to Sydney, Australia, cause some students there did the play and, um, but yeah, yeah, brick the play, and uh, and Ryan was very encouraging, you know, to me, uh, just because he was so kind, and um, I was like, yeah, I mean, really kind, decent people can be also brilliant creatively and work in Hollywood and make cool stuff. I mean, that was really Emily will tell you as well that we were just a little, huh? Okay, maybe this could be something we do. Hmm. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So you mentioned about, that was like 2009 uh, and you were talking about electric Jesus then. So how long has the journey of electric Jesus been ish? Uh, that's, that's <laughs> about the time when I was first, I had a, a draft of the script. The script was first called to hell with the devil. Uh, based on the Striper <laughs> record. And then I was like, yeah, that sounds like a horror movie. Like if you don't know the Striper record, you wouldn't get that illusion. So we changed it to electric Jesus. But at the time I had written a main draft of, of To Hell with the Devil. And then I did a major rewrite of it about 2012, I think, 2011, 2012. And so, and we were making other movies, you know, I, I was, you know, I I made a $8,000 feature in 2012. I made like a $50,000 feature film in 2014. So, you know, we were, we weren't just going to jump into doing Electric Jesus. We were trying to you know, figure out how to make movies. And, and so a lot of that time was this project is sitting over here and, you know, when the time comes, we'll do it. Yeah. And, wow. and to be just completely honest, it was too big of a jump. I mean, it was too big of a jump to go from the films we've been making to Electric Jesus, but it was also time to, in a way, uh, figure out if we were gonna be able to make a living doing this. So it took, um, you know, raising capital and, um, you know, dealing with state tax credits and making a business plan and all these things, we, you know, it was, uh, there was challenges to the production because we just were like, we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we think we should be good at it, I think. <laughs> That sounds a lot like someone else's experience. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's so funny, Chris, when I was listening to you list off things, I was also a high school drama teacher. I'm also an actor. I also thought, you know, maybe I could do this. How hard can it be? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. funny. But, you know, and, and I wouldn't change it. 
at all. I mean, because um, we learn so much and we're having opportunities now to do other things that are exactly what we want to do. So maybe the risk comes with some degree of reward, um, but it doesn't necessarily come with a reward. And, um, you know, um, somehow you have to figure out a way to stay at it until it works or until you just can't stay at, at it anymore. Yeah. And, so. Well, one thing I love about your story, and you started off this way, you said, you know, I was doing this thing and I was doing that thing and I had this experience and that experience. And when this film came along, I was ready. And yeah. I think, you know, I want other people listening to take encouragement from that. The stuff that you do in your past, whether you were a plumber or an actor or uh, you loved reading books or whatever it is, whatever is in your past, you know, it can come together to help you with this big thing that you want to do. It's not all lost. You don't have to go to film school. You don't have to, you know, do X, Y, and Z to be able to, to make a film and tell what you feel compelled to do. So uh, that's a wonderful lesson from your life that you just have to be ready. You have to be ready to say yes at that moment when the story comes to you so and when and you know i'd spent all those years working with teenagers and yeah so standing on a set in the summer of 2019 in columbus georgia with six teenagers around that i just kind of knew how to talk to how to i knew how to get them acting the way that i needed them to act you know it was very comfortable and i know i know filmmakers who are terrified of getting anywhere near children or teenagers but <laughs> i was you know the, all those years teaching had paid off in that oh yeah we're you know this is acting class. Right, right. Oh, that's so great. Well, Chris, it has been so great to have you here. Uh, you. You're just an amazing person. Congratulations on all your Best Director Awards. I feel you really deserve them. Uh, but I also think you should get awards for your writing, uh, for your song, you know, the songs that you uh, came up with, uh, for your creativity and marketing the film. Like, I really look up to you and applaud you for everything that you've done. So. Congratulations. Well, saying that Josh was going to kind of give all the creative credit to the actors, which is what always happens. You write these <laughs> words and you direct these beautiful scenes and then the actors. <laughs> thank you, Josh, for continuing that. You're welcome. That longstanding <laughs> injustice. <laughs> all right, Josh, why don't you take us out? All right. Well, thanks, Chris White, the director and writer of the film, for being on our podcast. And we'll get the actors on later. Okay. And thank you to our listeners for listening to Documentary First, where we believe everyone has a story to tell, and you can be the one to tell it. Yes, you can. Bye, everybody. <laughs>